with a message from God's Word, here's Charles Stanley. Once you and I have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we begin to immediately learn some lessons or some principles by which we learn to live the Christian life. But the big mistake we make is this. We learn those principles. We start out utilizing those principles or abiding by them. And after a while, we feel like we get a little confident and things are going, sort of going our way. We feel a little success in our Christian life. Next thing you know, we've had a big collapse or we've had a fault or a fall in some fashion. Why is it that somehow, even though we start out right, oftentimes we don't end up right? Well, one of the primary reasons is the fact that we drift away from the very principles that make us a success in whatever we're doing. And oftentimes, we think that we're practicing the same thing, but we've gotten so familiar with it, we've become so familiar with the Word of God, with the principles, with the messages that we hear, that the next thing you know, we are not practicing them, and then we're wondering what in the world's going on in our life. So what I'd like to do in this message, I want to deal with one of those very basic but awesome powerful principles that will make the difference in whether you live the Christian life victoriously or whether you fail in it. Not only that, but whether you can fail or whether you succeed in everything else you're doing in life because God has made it very clear in His Word there is one thing in this life that is so absolutely essential. It is essential every single day, no matter what. So I want you to turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 24. And in this particular passage, right before Jesus ascends, he gives his disciples a very specific command, absolutely essential to their whole future. That simple command not only would determine whether they succeeded in what they did, but also in how they lived. So if you'll notice, beginning in verse 44 of the 24th chapter of Luke. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You witnesses of these things. And notice this next verse. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Now, Right before his departure, Jesus said one of the most important things he could possibly have said. He had prepared them for this moment, but now he said to them, I want you to sit down in the city of Jerusalem until you be clothed with power from on high. What I want to talk about in this message is the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, to many people, their idea of the power of the Holy Spirit is some miraculous thing that God does uh, through some so-called healer or some outstanding preacher or teacher and so forth. But what I want you to understand in this message is this, that the work and the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit is not only available to every single believer, but is the will of God for every single believer, no matter who you are. And oftentimes, that is the big hedge we have to get across. Because so often people think, well, that's for missionaries, and this is for teachers, and this is for preachers, and certainly this has nothing to do with me as a businessman, or me as a mother, or me as a student. I'm a plumber, I'm a preacher, I'm a carpenter, uh, or I'm a secretary, or I work out here in the business world, and I'm ahead of this and ahead of that. What does the Holy Spirit have to do with any of this? Well, listen very carefully, because it is so very important you and I understand that this message is not limited to preachers and missionaries and Bible teachers, but God intends for it to be for every single person. So what I want to do, first of all, is to define what I mean by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is that divine authority and energy which God releases in the life of every single one of His children in order that you and I may live a godly life and that we may live a fruitful life. The power of the Holy Spirit is that divine energy, and listen, that divine energy and authority that God releases in and through every single believer 
in order that we might live a godly life and bear a fruitful life. So when he talks about being clothed with power from on high, that's the kind of power he's talking about. Now, let me just say this. The Holy Spirit cannot be manipulated. You can't make the Holy Spirit do anything. God has given us the Spirit. Therefore, we don't have to try to manipulate Him to do anything. The Spirit of God, once He comes into a person's life, listens, He energizes the body, He enlightens the mind to understand truth, and, listen, not only that, He inflames our spirit with a passion of devotion to Almighty God. What I'd like to do in this message is simply this. I want to give you a comprehensive view of the Holy Spirit. I want to start out with something very simple and move it to the more complex. One thing I'm certain, if you will listen carefully to this message, if you'll be wise enough to take some notes, you will not only be enlightened probably in some areas, but you're going to be encouraged in your life no matter what your vocation or what God has called you to do. So what I want to do is I want to answer five questions. I'm going to ask you to talk back to me. I'm going to ask you to give them back, so don't just sit there. I want you to be able to tell me back because, listen, you need to be able to tell someone else when they say, well, who is this Holy Spirit? Where did He come from? What's all this about? I not only want you to be able to answer the questions, but I want you to be able to answer them from an experience that you have in your life as a result of your relationship to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Question number one, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, it's very clear in the Bible who He is, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, listen, He is a person of the Trinity. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verses that we refer to often. But this is one of those truths that oftentimes slips right by us. In Genesis chapter 1, look if you will in verse 2. We all know what verse 1 says. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But notice verse 2. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Verse 26. Then God said, let us. Make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. When he says, let us make man in our image, who is us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that is brooding over the creation, so that the Spirit of God was certainly a part of the creation. Go back, if you will, on over to uh, John chapter 14 for a moment. And you'll recall in this 14th chapter of John when Jesus is encouraging his disciples at a moment which he knows is a prelude to great discouragement. Here's what he says in verse 16 of the 14th chapter. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he, not it, he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Jesus called the Holy Spirit, not an it, but he called him a person. So when somebody says, well, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. Now, Somebody says, but wait a minute, in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, and you're absolutely correct if you have a King James Version of the Bible, uh, the Bible refers uh, in that 26th verse and speaks of the Holy Spirit as it. But that is a translation of the third person singular, he, she, it. That particular reference is simply a translation of third person singular when it should have been something else. Now, the Spirit of the living God is not a force. He's somebody. He is somebody extremely important to your daily life and mine. If somebody says, well, look, tell me, who is this Holy Spirit? What is the first thing you're going to say? The Holy Spirit is a what? A person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is a promise of the Father. Notice, if you will, back in this uh, 24th chapter, what Jesus said, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father. And he says, You are to stay in the city until you be clothed with power from on high. The Spirit of the living God is not only, listen, He's not only a person of the Trinity, but He is a promise of the Father. Jesus promised that the Father would send the Holy Spirit. He said, He'll come and He'll be a helper to you. He'll be a comforter to you. He says, I'm sending Him. 
Therefore, he is the promise of the Father. And so he had been saying to those disciples all along, there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit is going to be in you, with you, and upon you. And at this moment when he was speaking, the Holy Spirit had not come upon the church as he did a little later on at Pentecost. And so when somebody says, well, who is this Holy Spirit? He, listen, the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. He is the promise of the Father. But thirdly, he is the gift to every single believer. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 2 for a moment. And you'll recall that Peter has preached that awesome sermon at Pentecost and thousands of people are being saved and lives are being changed. And what happens thereafter is certainly evidence of the fact that something awesome happened on that particular day. Listen to what happens. Now in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, so with that in mind, let's think about it this way. Somebody says, well, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. He is the promise of the Father, and He is the gift to every single believer. Now, once in a while, somebody will say, well, uh, you're a Christian? Yes. Uh, they'll say to you, well, have you got the Holy Ghost? Well, first of all, let me talk about ghost. The proper uh, translation is spirit. We think in terms of ghost, we think of some apparition out there somewhere. We're talking about somebody who's the person of the Trinity, the promise of the Father, and he was not a ghost. Listen, no person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is a ghost in terms of what we think in terms of ghost. He is a person of the Trinity. He is the spirit. Now, when somebody says to you, well, now, wait a minute, now tell me, who is this Holy Spirit? First of all, He is the what? Now, come on, all three of them. He is a person of the Trinity, the promise of the Father, and the gift to every single believer. He is the gift to every believer. So when somebody says, do you have the Holy Ghost? You say to them, listen, I not only have the Holy Ghost, I have the Holy Spirit. Forget the ghost business. I do have the Holy Spirit. Well, when did you get Him? Well, I got him, but usually what they're going to say to you is, when did you get it? Because there are multitudes of Christians out there who still refer to the Holy Spirit as it. When did you get it? Now, why do they say it instead of him? Here's the reason. Because their emphasis is not on his personhood, but their emphasis is on what they think he does. And so when they think in terms of it, they think in terms of some miraculous act, or they think in terms of some healing, or they think in terms of some power, some force. Jesus' emphasis of the Holy Spirit was not an it. Jesus' emphasis of the Holy Spirit was He is a helper whom the Father is going to send. And so therefore, when somebody says, well, do you have it? What you say is, look, have what? And they say, have the Holy Spirit. Well, He's not an it. The Holy Spirit is somebody. Well, who is it? Well, He's a person of the Trinity. He's the promise of the Father, and He's a gift to every single believer. Well, when did you get Him? I got Him when I was saved. How did you get Him when you were saved? Because that's exactly what God says. He says He baptized us into Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, there's so much false doctrine, so much erroneous doctrine that goes on. And if you were to ask this person, well, do you believe that the Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity? Oh, yes, I do. Well, why are you calling Him an it? Because I'm telling you, the emphasis of what they're talking about is what He does or something that they have seen or they have given to the Holy Spirit um, uh, some uh, reputation of doing this and doing that and doing the other that's uh, got folks all hepped up and hooped up and hollowed up and so forth. And they know absolutely nothing about the present day work of the Holy Spirit every single day of their life. Absolutely essential in our life. But it's very important you not understand who He is. You believe in Jesus? You believe in God the Father, you believe in the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity which make up the Godhead. And that is the Godhead is one, listen, three persons of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit make up the Godhead. When he said, let us make man in our image, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not God the person of the Father, not God the person of, the, of Jesus, and not God the it of the Spirit. No, he is a person of the Trinity, and the reason that's so important is because of why God sent him. Now, so when somebody says to you, who is the Holy Spirit? You're going to say the Holy Spirit is person of the Trinity, promise of the Father, gift to every single believer. Right. Now, why in the world did God send him? Why did God send him? Well, he says in this passage, now notice, he says, you are to sit down in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Here's the first reason God sent him. Now, both of these are equally important, but I want to put this one first. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit, listen, to enable us to do the work God has called us to do. He sent the Holy Spirit to enable us to do the work God has called us to do. Now, let's clarify something right fast. 
Oftentimes we want to put that in the category of apostles, preachers, the apostle Paul, Peter, preachers that day, missionaries, and so forth. Let me ask you something. Let me talk to you mothers for just a moment. Would you not agree that to raise up godly children, teenagers, for example, today, in an ungodly world, go into ungodly schools with all the ungodly influence and temptations around them, would you not agree, mom, would you not agree, dad, that one of the most awesome responsibilities, one of the toughest jobs today is to raise up godly children who believe the Word of God, who stand for what they believe, who will not yield to temptation, who will not succumb to peer pressure, and who will stand strong in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ among their peers. Would you not agree that is one of the most difficult tasks today? Amen? Amen. Well, let me ask you, if you feel very adequate in doing that yourself as a mother or father, please say amen. Right. Dead silence. You have to listen carefully. You see? Now, so what's the Holy Spirit have to do with that? Because God knew, and it has always been true, that it's difficult to raise godly families amidst godless societies. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians and these other uh, cities, the churches there, they were just as godless and oftentimes more so than anything that we can think of today. And so the work of the Holy Spirit is not limited to preachers and teachers and missionaries, but to every single facet. For example, you're a businessman out there in the world. You've got all kinds of temptations and trials around you and all kinds of things that you have to face and decisions you have to make. Would you not agree that you need somebody wiser than you to help you, strengthen you, enable you to make wise decisions, to live above temptations, live a godly life in a godless society with all the greed and the competition and all the rest? How do you not get mixed up and absolutely overwhelmed and after a while drift into the same principles of greed and selfishness and self-centeredness and going to have more and more and more and becoming material? materialistic and secularistic, absolutely. If you let yourself drift, you'll be right in the middle of it, and before long, you'll be out of church. You know why God said, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high? For the simple reason, he knew what had happened in his own life. He knew what was going to happen in their lives. For example, let's go back to Luke chapter 4 for a moment. Luke chapter 4, concerning the life of the Lord Jesus, here's what happens. He's been baptized. You recall that the Holy Spirit came upon him in a very special way at his baptism. And then chapter 4 of Luke, beginning in verse 1, says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, look, if you will, in verse, in verse 14. So he's out there being tempted after the temptation. The Bible says, Listen, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding districts, and he began teaching in the synagogues and praising, was praised by all. Goes to the synagogue, they hand him the scroll. Here's what happens, verse 18. He opens the book and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of recite to the blind, set free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. It's interesting that his emphasis here is on the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ. Before he began his ministry, remember, he was out there as a carpenter. Then he came down to John the Baptist and uh, he was baptized. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And uh, then he's out there in the wilderness. He comes back full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit to do what the Father had called him to do. Go, back, if you will, to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. You recall in Acts chapter 9, this is the account of the Apostle Paul's uh, conversion experience. Well, uh, he's carried to uh, uh, someone's uh, home here. And notice, if you will, in verse 17. And uh, verse 17 of this ninth chapter. And Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me also that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why so quickly? Why did he say, gain your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit? Here's the reason. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales. He regained his sight, arose and was baptized. He took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. They were amazed. They said, This is a man who's destroyed us and uh, bound us. And now here he comes preaching and teaching. The scripture says in that same chapter, 
that he was absolutely baffling the minds of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In fact, he was so absolutely persuasive that they were trying to kill him. They tried to assassinate him thereafter. He gets saved. Listen, somebody says, well, I got saved and things got worse. Join the crowd. The apostle Paul got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit. Next thing you know, they're trying to kill him. And for the rest of his days in the ministry, they're trying to kill him. All of his ministry, they're trying to kill him. Why? Because he is speaking the truth of God and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Now think about this. If Jesus began his ministry following the Spirit of God coming upon him in a special way for his work, if the Apostle Paul began his ministry following the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon him, being baptized there, and if Jesus said to his apostles, you walk with me, you watch miracles, you've seen me, you've heard me, you have experienced uh, casting out demons and all the rest, but you're not ready to do the work that I've called you to do because it is a supernatural work. You can't do it in the natural. Because it's a supernatural work, you've got to have supernatural power. What is that supernatural power? It is a divine authority and energy released in a person's life and through a person's life in order to enable them to live a godly life and to live a fruitful life. So he said to them, you wait until the Spirit of God comes. Remember, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. One of the primary reasons he came is to equip us for the work that God has called us to do. Now, that work may be one of a variety of things, as we mentioned a few moments ago. And so often, people listen to a message on the Holy Spirit, and they relegate it to something else. I'm here to tell you. Listen, he would not have indwelt you, every single believer. He would not have indwelt you if he had not intended for you to do something in your life and him to do something through your life that you would need the Spirit of God living and working within you. I believe any person who, listen, no matter what your vocation, no matter where you are in school, no matter what the situation may be, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, listen, you have the supernatural power and authority within you to enable you to succeed in whatever God has called you to do. And so therefore, he said to them, you're to wait. Supernatural work, done what? In supernatural power. Jesus, the apostles, and all the rest. Now, why is it, for example, that so many churches are, are just sort of dead? I mean, you go in, the music's dead, and the preaching's dead. There's nothing going on. I'll tell you why. You show me a church where the Spirit of God is neglected, where there's no emphasis on the Holy Spirit, no emphasis on the blood of Jesus, no emphasis on the cross, and I'll show you that there's something dreadfully missing. You show me a person who understands the work of the Holy Spirit in their life and a person who's practicing that. You show me a church where they understand what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. Listen, their singing's going to be better. There's going to be joy in their heart. There's going to be a smile upon their face. There's going to be something alive. And so, therefore, Jesus said, you're to wait until you be endued with power from on high. What is that power? Divine energy and divine authority that comes in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, think about this. You can't ever say to God, when he called you to do something, you can't ever tell him, well, I can't do that. You know why? When he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell you, listen, that eliminated all excuses forever in your life of saying to him, I can't do it. First of all, would God, listen, would he call you to do something he wouldn't equip you to do? No, he would not. Would he require of you something that he himself would not do through you? No, he would not. Therefore, whatever God calls you to do, listen, my friend, the only right thing for you to do is to say yes to him because you say, well, I don't feel adequate. Who does feel adequate? Listen, the key to relying upon the Holy Spirit is feeling personal inadequacy that drives us to do what? First of all, to recognize our need of him. Second, to rely upon him. And thirdly, to trust him to do and to be in us everything we need him to be. There's not a single one of us who can do the work that God has called us to do and do it well and do it successfully and endure the difficulty and the hardship and the pain and the suffering and the criticism and all the rest apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to see some folks out there who are doing seemingly pretty well in their life, but you know what? Uh, there are some folks who can do pretty well in the flesh. You say, well, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. Why is it not enough? Because, listen, God has given to every single one of us a potential. None of us know what our potential is. Here's the question you have to ask yourself. Am I willing to go through my life living just half pint size? Am I willing just to do pretty well when I could do a whole lot better? Am I willing to give it just some of my energy, give it all? Listen, one thing I know for certain, there's no such thing as a spirit-filled person doing a sloppy job. There's no such thing as a spirit-filled person being calloused toward others and careless in their work, indifferent to their responsibility. Listen, if every Christian in America was full of the Holy Spirit, you know what would happen to our economy? Our economy would absolutely explode internationally in such a fashion there'd be no human explanation for it. 
If every believer got up every single morning, full of the Holy Spirit, and went to work, doing their best, giving it all they have, with the right motivation and an absolute total dependence upon God, their work would be better, their attitude would be better, their spirit would be better, there'd be a joy in their heart, and besides that, more than likely, they'd make more money. That's what most folks are after, is more money. And you know what? And when you see people who are very calloused, and, and their attitudes and very careless in what they do, indifferent. They don't want to give it their best. They say, you know, why should I do it when somebody else can do it? Let me tell you something. If that's your attitude in the, in the working world, you could not be full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, listen, you know what He's going to do? What do we say? We say He does what? He energizes the body. He enlightens the mind and He inflames this passion within us to do what? in our devotion and love and obedience to Almighty God. We want to do our best. We want to give it our best. Listen, we don't, we don't want to work uh, uh, six and a half hours a, a day when we ought to be working eight. We don't want to check out 30 minutes ahead of time. We want to be able to do everything that God requires of us. And one thing for certain, He will never require of you more than you can do in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you and I get in the flesh, we get in our own energy, and I've certainly been there at times when I absolutely could not do all that I thought I ought to be doing, which some of which certainly was not what God was up to. And sometimes we have expectations of ourselves more than what God does. But what He's promised to do is enable us and to equip us both in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and energy to do what He has required of us, what He has called us to do, and He will make you a success at whatever you're doing when your reliance is upon the Spirit of God because what you're doing, you're looking to Him, depending upon Him, waiting upon Him, trusting Him to give you guidance and direction and energy and strength and wisdom to do the job. There's not a single person, every single solitary believer has the right to claim the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in their life for whatever God has called you to do. When I meet folks sometimes and they're down in the dumps and they're having a hard time and things are not going so good, when I begin to ask them some questions, I know exactly, not always, but exactly most of the time, what's going on. You know what they're trusting in? Their strength, their energy. What are they trusting in? Their know-how, their experience. They're trusting in what somebody else says, and besides that, they're trusting in somebody else to get them along in life. Listen, don't trust someone else to get you along in life. Trust Almighty God who created you and has equipped you and has enabled you to do and become what He has enabled and equipped you to do. Let, rely upon Him and see what He can do for you. Somebody says, well, I'm looking for a promotion and... Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to convince and persuade, and I hope they see my good work. You know what you ought to do? Just be sure God sees your good work. When God sees your good work, He knows how to motivate people to promote you to wherever He wants you. And listen, you do a good job down here in a small place, God will put you where He wants you. You know why? Because you've proven to be trustworthy to Almighty God wherever you are. He says, you sit in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. If you don't like the way things are going in your life, you don't like the way things are going in your job, listen, then you get full of the Holy Spirit and then just say, God, all right, here's my life, and I'm going to come to that in a few moments. I now want to see what you do. I see what I do, Lord. What a mess I've made of things. Now I want to see what you do. And my friends, you'll be absolutely amazed at what God will do in your life. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, what your vocation, what your motivation out there is, God will begin to work in your life in a very unusual way. Remember what we said, that the power of the Holy Spirit is God's divine energy and authority, listen, and authority to do what we need to do. For example, let's say that uh, your uh, teenage son comes in and uh, uh, he's giving you a little lip about something, and uh, you say, well, what's that got to do with the Holy Spirit? Here's what it's got to do with it. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. <laughs> Parents can speak lovingly, but listen, in the authority of Almighty God to their children. Now remember this. If your son or your daughter is a, is, is a believer, you know what the Spirit of God's going to do? The Spirit of God's going to convict that child that, listen, not only have I heard from my mother or my daddy, I believe God's trying to say something to me. You see, don't relegate the work of the Spirit just out there preaching and teaching. He wants them to be involved in every single aspect of your life, no matter what it is. You come to some financial decision, you listen to this one, that one, and the other one. Why don't you listen to God? Unless you say, well, I, how do I listen to God? You know how, how you can listen to Him? You ask Him, God, I don't, want, I don't understand exactly how to do this. Would you send somebody in my life who is full of the Spirit, who is led by your principles and guided by your principles to help me understand and to make a wise decision? That is exactly what God will do. There are godly people in every field, full of the Holy Spirit, ready and willing to help other godly people who want to know what to do and how to do it. Listen, 
This is a supernatural life that you and I have. And so therefore, he says to them, you wait till you be endued with power from on high. So every single one of us indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us has the right to claim and to call upon the Spirit of God to enable us to do whatever he's called us to do. So the first reason that God sent the Holy Spirit was number one, what? To enable us to do the work God has called us to do. Now, does that leave out any believers? No, it does not. Every single believer. Now, the second reason, not in necessarily in this order. Second reason is to enable us to live the life He's called us to live. Do the work He's called us to do, enable us to live the life He's called us to live. Well, what kind of life is that? He's called us to live a holy life. You know, oh, I can't do that. Well, let's just, wait a minute. Let's just find out what a holy life is. Does he not say in 1 Peter that he says, we're to be holy even as he is holy? Does that mean sinless? Well, if that means sinless, I give up and quit, and all the rest of us are going to have to also. Living a holy life does not mean a sinless life. Why do I know that? Because God, listen, God knows how absolutely human every single one of us is. None of his disciples lived a perfect life. None of his disciples lived a sinless life. If you don't believe that, you look in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, what I don't want to do, I find myself doing. What I want to do, I find myself not doing. Until he came to that eighth chapter and he talked about the victory that he discovered in his relationship to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now, the holy life is not a sinless life. What is a holy life? A holy life is a life having trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior that is bent toward God with a devotion and desire for God and a hunger and thirst to live for Him. That does not mean we're not going to make mistakes because we all came in this world with a sinful nature. Now, you who are grandparents and uh, you go to see your grandson or your granddaughter and that sweet little thing and, and uh, you say, well, and, and sometimes they'll say, well, how in the world could somebody as sweet and as pretty as that act like that way? How could they act that way? Real simple, sinful nature, just like the one we all came in the world with. And so we all came in the world with one. Now we either live by it and let it rule and dominate our life, all of our lives, and wreck and ruin our lives, or we have an experience with Jesus Christ by which we are saved, an experience with the Holy Spirit by which we live in the power of the Spirit of the living God who is within us. Therefore, a person says, well, you know, I've tried my best to live the Christian life. And I've met people over the years, many people who've said, well, you know what? I've tried. It doesn't work. Yes, it does work. Well, I tried and it didn't work. Don't tell me it works because it doesn't work. Yes, it does. Well, what is it about it that doesn't work? Well, I tried it. You know what the problem is? I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried. And in my own strength and my own energy. Now, I recognize a lot of people I grow up in uh, churches where uh, when you get saved, here's what they say. Now, you must do the following things. You need to read the Ten Commandments, obey the Ten Commandments, read the Sermon on the Mount, obey the Sermon on the Mount. You need to uh, come to church um, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, read your Bible, pray, tie the income. And by the time they get to that whole list, you say, Whew, how can I do all of that? You know what? You can read your Bible and you can pray and you can give and you can go to church and backslide all over yourself. You know why? Because that be, I can do all that in my energy. But listen, walking in the Spirit Walking in obedience to God, I cannot do in the flesh. Now, the Bible says we have one of two lifestyles. We either have a lifestyle in the flesh, I'm going to define that in a moment, or we have a lifestyle in the Spirit. The Bible says we're to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. What in the world does he mean by flesh? That's Paul's word for walking in our sinful nature. And to the believer, we have a new spirit and a new nature, but you know what? We still have our naturalness. Now, I would have been wonderful if God had taken all of our naturalness away, but he didn't. So therefore, we still have the capacity to sin against God anytime we choose to. If I walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is controlling my life, then surely there's going to be a different kind of lifestyle. If I'm walking in the flesh, in our naturalness, a carnality, as the Bible calls it, whether it's flesh, carnality, or naturalness, uh, that's, that's all the same. And you've heard people say, well, you know, what I do is just natural. Sure it is. It's natural for a lost man if he wants to drink or carry on and carouse and mess up his or her life. That is the natural way because Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, he says, now in times past we walked according to the course of this age, the natural lifestyle of this age, which is what? Seeking after, hungering after, thirsting after, lusting after anything, all things, everything that will satisfy this big open gap in my heart. And you see, the truth is God's made a place in our life only that for Jesus, only He can fill it. 
And therefore, people live their lives and they become discouraged. They say, I've tried to live a Christian life, I can't. Well, let me ask you a question. What part of the Holy Spirit have in you living your life when you are failing and having difficulty and hardship? Doesn't mean you're not going to have any hardship in your life. But God sent the Holy Spirit to enable you and me to live a life we cannot live in the flesh. We can't live it in our own strength. And I think one of the most awesome moments as I look back in my own life, the night that I realized for the first time that I could not live the Christian life God did not intend for me to live a Christian life, but my trying, begging, praying, pleading, fasting, and all the things that I tried to do to live a godly life and felt like an absolute failure over and over and over again. When I read one single chapter, the first chapter of the little book, they found the secret about Hudson Taylor and recognized what Jesus meant when he said, I am the vine, you are the branch. The branch abides in the vine. He said, I am abiding in you and you're abiding in me. The branch does not bear fruit of itself. And listen, you've never seen branches out there going, trying to bear fruit. But the branch just lives off the vine. The sap that runs in the vine runs in the branch. And it's that sap that comes in the stem and produces delicious grapes. Here's what I did for a long time. I'm over here going, trying to get the fruit. And you know what? I failed just like everybody else failed. The night that I recognized what Jesus meant. When he said, I'm abiding in you and you're abiding in me. It is his life in us, his life through us, the Christian life. Listen, the Christian life is this. It is Christ living his life in and through us in the power and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Listen, you can't do the work God's called you to do apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't live the life that God has called you to live apart from the Holy Spirit. Listen, it is a supernatural work, supernatural power, supernatural life, supernatural power. And the reason there's so much failure, I think, oftentimes is most people are totally ignorant of the fact that the Spirit of God is an essential part of my life every single solitary day. So you've heard us talk about putting on the whole armor of God, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6. And what is he talking about? He says, put on the helmet of salvation. And I know how he says it, but I start from the top to the bottom. That's where I put it on. Helmet of salvation, do what? Protect my thinking. Breastplate of righteousness, protect my emotions. Girdle of truth, to be sure I'm walking in it. Sandals of peace, because I want to be a peacemaker. Sword of the Spirit, defensive and offensive weapon. And above all, take in the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Well, let me add something to that. When you wake up tomorrow morning, here's what you do. You say, I want to thank you, Lord. First of all, I realize that I'm absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit to enable me today. To live the life you want me to live, do the work you've called me to do. Secondly, Not only do I recognize that, but I choose to rely upon the Spirit to give me direction and guidance during this day. Thirdly, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to accept as done your guidance and your direction for me this day. And you know what happens when you get up with a full armor on? And when you just say, when you go ahead and confess it right up front, I am absolutely totally dependent upon you today. You know the problem with that? Most people want to be in control. Most people want to be in charge. Most people want to feel adequate. When I think about all these success books and all these success seminars and and, uh, things that are out there and people talking about being successful in life and being able to have self-confidence, and there is a godly kind of confidence, uh, being self-confident, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, and the Scripture says, no, you can't do it. So you have to decide who you're going to believe. You're going to believe God or them. Now listen, what you have to ask for, listen, you have to ask for what do you want? Do I want life at its fullest? And that's one way. Do I just want what the world has to offer? More money, more prestige, more prominence, more position, more this, getting this and having my security wrapped up in things that I can lose in a split second? Or do I want life at its best? Now, if I just want what the world has to offer, I can do some of those things in my own strength. But listen, if I want something that counts, and as I said to someone yesterday who said to me, they said, you know, uh, I, I said, well, how are you doing? Well, he said, um, Uh, I have joy, but I'm not very happy in my circumstance. Listen, you know, you don't have to be happy in your circumstance. There are all things, but probably something about all of our lives we would like to change that we think would make us happier. The truth is we can have a joy whether we have real happiness or not. That joy overrides the difficulty, the hardships, the trial, the tribulations, and all the things we have and we don't have. There's something about a relationship with Christ. There's a joy on the inside of us, this intimacy we can have with Him. What is that? That's the work of the Spirit of God doing, drawing us to Him. My prayer daily, many times a day, is, is God, draw me to yourself. Draw me to yourself. Draw me to yourself because I know that intimacy is the key to a deep sense of abiding joy that nothing in this world can destroy no matter what. 
God desires that you and I daily recognize our dependence upon, our need of, our desperate need so often of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life affirming that to be true in our life, relying upon Him and watching to see what He does. Listen, all of us have made messes of certain areas of our life. But you know what? When you depend upon Him and see what He does, it's amazing what He can do. And even no matter what you're going through, He will sustain you through that no matter what. Two reasons He sent Him. Number one, He sent the Holy Spirit in order to do what? To enable us to do the work God called us to do, and secondly, to do what? Enable us to live the life He's called us to live. What I'd like to do is to give you a list of, um, listen to this now. I'm going to give you a list of the works of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine. Most of these go on daily. Now, I want you to see what they are, and I want you to understand how very important it is that we understand This is something that God is in the process or desires to do in your life and mine every day. This may not be what you're facing in life. So let's think about the work of the Spirit. And what I'll do is I'll give you the uh, work of the Spirit, and then I will give you the chapter. Because I don't want you to just read one verse. I want you to read what's, what's in the context of it. Now, when you think about the work of the Spirit, we said, uh, first of all, we, when we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, this is divine energy. And listen, divine energy that God places in our life to physically and emotionally enable us to do what He's called us to do. And so, God is in a very practical way working in our life moment by moment, day by day. With that comes the authority. With that authority, there's a sense of confidence. But listen, it isn't human, natural confidence. It's confidence based on a relationship. Confidence based on what he says the Holy Spirit will do in our life. A sense of authority. We can speak with authority because we are absolutely certain and sure what God is saying. Now, think about this. I'm going to give you all these, jot them down, and I'm going to come back for just a moment. First of all, the first work of the Holy Spirit is that he convicts us of sin. That's how we got saved. His conviction of our sin in uh, John chapter 16. He regenerates us. That is, He brings about the salvation experience as a result of that conviction in John chapter 3. Then the Bible says He indwells us. He lives on the inside in our spirit in Romans chapter 8. He seals us forever as a child of God in Ephesians chapter 1. That is, once we're saved by the grace of God, we have Him indwelling us, and the Bible says that He is God's earnest money. He is God's down payment, so to speak, that we belong to Him, and that all that God has promised for us in heaven, He has for us. Not only that, the Bible says in the 14th chapter of John, He is our teacher. I may speak words, but the Spirit of God must teach you the truth. He's our teacher. Not only that, He is the one who reminds us Same chapter there. He's the one who reminds us of things that we know, things that we've been taught when we need to be remembered. Not only that, he says he is our God in the 16th chapter of John. He's our God. He's the one who will guide us into all truth. Not only that, he says in the same chapter, he's the one who reveals truth to us when we need understanding of the truth. The scripture says that he is also our comforter in that 14th chapter of John. The Scripture says He's not only that, but He's the one who gives us spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, He's the one who not only gives us spiritual gifts, but He's the one who fills us uh, with the Holy Spirit. He's the one who, listen, who does what? He's the one who bears fruit through us in Galatians chapter 5. He's the one who empowers us in this 24th chapter of Luke as well as the first chapter of Acts. Now, I want you to think about something. Every single area of your life and my life in which we are inadequate within ourselves, the Spirit of God is committed to working in your life and mine in that area. Now, let's think about this for a moment. This person of the Holy Spirit, now think about this person of the Holy Spirit, he's the one who not only convicted us of sin to begin with and brought us to salvation, regenerated us, but he's the one who convicts us now of sin. He is the one who indwells us. He's the one who has baptized us into Christ, placed us into Him. He's the one who has sealed us to the day of redemption. 
He's the one who guides us and teaches us and brings things to our remembrance and reveals truth to us. He's the one who is our comforter. He's the one who gives us spiritual gifts. He's the one who bears the fruit through us. He's the one who fills us. He's the one who empowers us. Now listen, anyone who does those 12 or 13 things for me daily except for saving me because that happened once and for all. I need him. I want him. I must rely upon him. And I have a reason to wake up every single morning absolutely confident. Confident of what? That in the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit, by the fact that He has sent, been sent to live on the inside of me, I can know for certain today that I'm not going to waste my time if I will walk in His power, that is, in His divine energy, in His authority. If my heart is bent toward Him and my hunger is to know Him, I'm going to be able to come home at night being able to thank God and praise Him no matter what I may have faced and been through in life. This has been a good day, and God has blessed me today. Why? Because the Spirit of God was doing His supernatural work in my life in that day, in that moment. Now listen, tell me, give me a good reason to get up down in the dumps. Anybody? Give me a good reason to get... Now, I know that sometimes a person can be emotionally depressed over certain things that have to do with chemical things in life. I, I, I understand that. But mo you know what a lot of depression is? It's just down and out, gloomy, gloomy, gloomy. You know why? Because not trusting God. Now, think about it for a moment. I believe I could give you enough facts that could happen in your life to give you a nervous breakdown before you walk out of here. <laughs> you know where most people are living? Here's where they're living. They're living in their own strength. They're living in their own energy. They're facing a wicked, vile world. They could blow. Listen, there are already enough atomic bombs out there, uh, out there floating around among many nations to destroy the whole world four times. How, do you go to bed thinking about that? Some people do. You're driving down the expressway 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, and somebody's three feet from you. All they got to do is take one wrong turn. It's over. You worry about that every day? You know the economy could collapse? You could get ill health. All a thousand things could happen to us. Is a believer supposed to get up every morning thinking, oh God, I'm going to make it today. <laughs> Lord, I think about all these things. I'm going to lose my job, could lose this, could lose that. No. Listen to what Jesus said. How in the world could he say this apart from the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Here's what he said. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because there's somebody living on the inside of you who has sealed you forever as a child of God. You know what a lady said to me on their way out this morning? She said, she said, I'm almost there. I'm on the verge. I'm, I'm right on the verge. Verge of what? I'm on the verge of, of believing in eternal security. <laughs> so lady, I want to push you over right now. <laughs> because, if, listen, if you don't believe you're eternally secure, where in the world are you? This is where you are. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Did I live up? Did I live up to it? No, you can't live up to it. This is why Paul said, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ is living in me in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the life which I now live, I live with the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, would you not agree that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity, the promise of the Father, and what's the last one? Gift to every single believer that he came to enable us to do the work that God has called to do, live, us, live the life that God has called us to live. And we named about 12 or 13 things that, that he does in our life, almost all of them every single day, if we'll allow him. Now, how, the big question, how do I become full of the Holy Spirit? How do I walk in the Spirit? Listen carefully. Listen and say amen. amen. It's so simple, and you know what? I, like so many other people, try to make it so complex because I grew up in a situation where it appeared to be complex. You had to walk down the aisle, get on your knees, pray, beg, plead, cry, hope something's going to hit you. I hope you could hold on or, or something or see something in order to get full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not being critical because that's where those folks were. I understand that. The problem is it was a real difficult for me because I expected something. I kept thinking, well, what's going to hit me? What am I going to hold on to? What am I going to have to do? In other words, all these things I went through, what kind of spiritual gift am I going to get? You, know what? you want to be full of the Holy Spirit? It's just this simple. Having trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, by placing your trust in Him and what He did at the cross of Calvary, and receiving Him as your Savior by faith, here's what you do. First of all, you've got to recognize you need 
You've got to recognize your need of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you don't, you'll never be fooled. You know what you'll do? You'll do it in your energy. You know one of the most, uh, uh, probably the most difficult things for people to deal with in their life? If they're talented, skilled, gifted, or good looking, or whatever it might be, all the things they put together, that some people have got, seemingly have it all together. You know what? All of that is a detriment. Why? They trust in their looks. They trust in their skill. They trust in their ability. They trust in their talents. They trust in everything else but God. You know what? They don't, they say, why do I need God? If you're one of those persons who feels inadequate, thank God for it. If you're one of those persons who thinks, oh God, I, I feel so inadequate, thank God for that. Let me tell you something, friend. I'm inadequate every single day. I, now listen, I don't just feel that. I know that to be true. You say, well, how could you be inadequate? I'll tell you why. Because I'm human, just like everybody else. And you know what? We're all inadequate. Some of us are just smart enough to know we are, and some of us are smart enough not to I don't know it. First of all, recognize my absolute need of the Holy Spirit, of His fullness in my life. Secondly, I must desire to be filled. If you don't have a desire to be full of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. Now, I'm going to explain just a second what that means, but I want you to get these words down first. First of all, having been saved, recognize my need. Secondly, desire. And thirdly, I must be willing, listen, I must be willing to repent of sin. I must be willing to repent of sin in my life. Whatever God brings to my mind, I have to deal with it. The fourth thing, I have to surrender my life to the Holy Spirit. Now, listen carefully. When somebody says, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Here's what it means. It means to walk surrendered to the control, listen, surrendered to the control of the Holy Spirit in my life. What do you want me to do, Father? What would you have me to do? Willing to live under His control. Willing to submit to His control. If I'm not willing to submit to His control, then I'm not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit because fullness of the Spirit speaks of the control of the Spirit. If I'm full of the Holy Spirit, that means I've surrendered my will to Him to say, not my will, but yours be done. So step number one, recognize my need. Step number two, have a desire. Step number three, deal with any sin that, that hinders me. Step number four, what's step number four? Surrender my life to Him, which means, listen, walking in voluntary submission to the Holy Spirit in my life, allowing Him to control. And what's the next one? Simply this, believing Him. Just believe that He'll do what He promised to do. What did Paul say? He said, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen carefully. God would not ask me, or require me to do something if he wouldn't do it. Now here's where I had my biggest struggle. It took me years to get through this one. I kept thinking, okay, repented, prayed, cried, begged, fasted, I mean, and kept expecting something to happen. It was one Friday afternoon, somewhere around four o'clock. When for some reason, I don't know how it took me so long to get to this place, Write this scripture down, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. What does it say? Listen to this. This is the confidence that we have in Him, in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is certainly according to His will, so He heard me. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, we know we have, at that moment, we have the petition that we desired of Him. Did you know, I'd struggle for years about how, how would I know this, that, and the other. The moment I accepted that verse is real, from that moment, for the first time in my life, I knew what it meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So what have we said? There must be, an, listen, awareness of the need, a desire, a confession, repentance of sin, and asking Him, trusting Him, having surrendered the best I know how, everything, trusting Him and seeing what He'll do. Now, what can you expect if you ask the Holy Spirit to fill you? Number one is joy. He says in that fifth chapter, fifth chapter of Ephesians, when he's talking about, uh, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit and being filled, he says, do not be, do not be drunk with wine, whereas in excess, but he says, you're not to be filled with the Holy Spirit. L listen to what he says. He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know what? 
You get full of the Spirit, you're going to have joy in your life. Does that mean everything around you is going to straighten out? Not necessarily. It just means that you're going to be able to have a peace in the midst of all that no matter what. First of all, there's joy. Secondly, there's going to be fruit. There's no such thing as a Spirit-filled Christian who is a spectator. A Spirit-filled Christian is involved in some fashion, in somebody or some people's lives, or in some work of ministry somehow. Spirit-filled Christians are not those who are spectators. The third thing is your faith is going to become stronger and stronger continually. As you walk in the Spirit, walk in submission, you know why it's going to become stronger? Here's why. Because God's going to begin to do things in your life and through your life that's going to amaze you. You're going to be standing back and say, ah, didn't know that. Well, Lord, why is it taking me so long? When you and I come to the last breath in our life, we're probably going to be saying the same thing. Lord, why did it take me so long to learn such awesome truths in life? And so I want to say to all of you young people who sit here week after week after week, listen, do not take what you hear for granted. What I wouldn't have given if somebody had started me out at the age of 12 and taught me what I have attempted to teach through the power of the Holy Spirit, the kids in this church over all these years. My, 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 if I'd have just learned all that. But you know what? Years go by. We begin to understand more and more the truth of God's Word, and, and, and all of us get blessed as He keeps teaching us the truth. Listen, there's going to be joy. There's going to be fruitfulness in your life. There's going to be a strength in your faith. Now, somebody says, no, wait a minute now. I want to ask one last question. How long does that, does that last forever? Is it just a one-time thing that you get full of the Spirit? No. So, all right, what I want to know is how long can I walk in the Spirit? You listen and say amen. amen. This is how long you can walk in the Spirit. You can walk in the Spirit. That is, you can walk in the Spirit and in His power just as long as you are willing to submit to His control in your life. This decision, that decision, this decision, that decision, this decision. He says, well, does that mean I can walk in the Spirit a long time? Absolutely. You say, okay. Now, suppose I choose to take control. Suppose I decided, I know that's what God wants, here's what I want. Suppose I just downright sin against God. Then what? Listen carefully. Here's what. You confess it. You repent of it. You thank God for His forgiveness. Somebody says, no, that's awfully easy. Wait a minute. The crucifixion of Jesus was not easy. My friend, listen to me carefully. This is what grace of God is all about. The grace of God is His forgiveness purchased for you and me through, listen, the atoning death of His Son on the cross. The only reason you and I can confess and repent of sin and instantaneously experience forgiveness is because of the awesome, awful price Jesus paid on the cross when He died and took your sin debt and mine in full almost 2,000 years ago. That's the reason. It appears to be simple, but it is not simple. What do you do? You confess it, you repent of it, you thank Him for your forgiveness, and you move on. Now, here's what the devil's going to do. Aha, uh -huh. see there, I knew you couldn't live it. Mm-hmm. So what does he do? He gets you in one of these pity parties. Well, you know, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I tried, I, I did my best, I tried, God, I guess it's just not working for me, and I guess I just can't walk in the Spirit. That is purely satanic. Listen, pity parties are not allowable in the child of God. Why? Because there's no reason for it. The Spirit of God doesn't leave you because you sin against Him. The Spirit of God convicts you. Doesn't, the Spirit of God doesn't say, He's going to convict me and then leave me if I don't straighten out. No, you know what He's going to do? He's going to turn up the heat. That's what He's going to do. He doesn't leave us. He turns up the heat. Why does He turn up the heat? Because He loves us. The Spirit of God, listen, the Spirit of God has sealed us. Listen to this now. The Spirit of God's already sealed you under the day of redemption. Listen, you and I are His purchased possession. He's not leaving us. He's taken us all the way. And some of us are probably going to go kicking and screaming, but He's going to get us there all the way, no matter what. But you know what life at its best is like? Surrendering our life to Him and, and just watching to see what Almighty God can do in your life. Now, you've got two choices. You can either keep living your life the way you live it, or you can make the most awesome discovery of finding out what God will do in your life, in every aspect of your life, if you will recognize your need of the Holy Spirit, 
Having recognized that need, you have a strong desire for change in your life. You confess whatever sin God brings to your mind. You just lay down control and tell him that you want him to prevail in the control of your life. And then you just thank him for filling you with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Your life won't be the same. That's the other choice, the best choice, the wisest choice you could possibly make. And Father, how grateful we are that you are so good to us that in your patience and love for us, you just wait years for us to finally realize what it's all about. But it's my prayer today that you cut that time short for everybody who listens to this message. Sink it deep in our hearts. Let it roll over in our minds. Let it be inescapable in its effect. Let it make an impact over and over and over again. It is my prayer that those who are listening to this message would accept the challenge and stand back and watch what an awesome work you can do in their life which is what you desire to do for every single one of us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.